Good morrow, good afternoon, good evening, wherever ye be. Welcome to a special, special episode of Ancient Mysteries Unearthed, St. Patrick's Day edition. Unfortunately, I've got no beer in the house, but a little bit of whiskey in the old cup will do just fine. Chris, how are you top of the morning? Oh, you know what there, laddie? I'm good. I don't know what accent that was that came out of me there. But oh, it um, was not the Irish. It was not the Irish then. No, it's not. Yes, all. everyone seems to take quite a bit offense when you do an, an, a lovely bad accent, but I assure you that uh, that the Irish were the last ones to take themselves too seriously. So uh, uh, let's get into it. Happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. At least this is when this is being recorded. We are on St. Patty's Day. Uh, big, 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 big day for us here in the uh, North Americas. But uh, Chris, how are you doing today? What did you have planned for us on St. Patrick's Day himself? Yeah, well, um, let's get into some folklore on fairies and uh, these b- magical beings of the, uh, not just the forest, but some nowadays in urban uh, places as well. But basically those magical leprechaun fairy beings, because they're all interchangeable, you know. Uh, See what you did there. Yeah. You know, yeah, I had to throw in a little Irish. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, though, you know what? It's funny uh, when you were saying, would you like to do a podcast today? And I'm going, well, I'm not uh, I'm not in the bar drunk just yet, so I might have time. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we were talking about it and, and wondering what, what we should do. And, of course, we made a joke about leprechauns, but what is a leprechaun if it's not uh, one of the little people, one of the magical little people that we do have stories about? And once again... Chris, like I always say in to all our viewers, when I get interested is when it's not just a uh, a monocultural phenomenon, when it starts to become pan-cultural is where you start to really get me. So, you know, I know for a fact that in Iceland, uh, fairies are considered um, not folklore, basically. And if it is kind of like a ha 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 to us tourists, we're like, you can't believe in this. They're like, well, I assure you we do. Uh, I know that, yeah, in, in, in Ireland, obviously we have the, the fable of the leprechaun. Um, I know that there's lots of tales of little people living in the forests as well in, 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 in some of the rainforests as well. And I know that as we go out to India and Asia, uh, once again, these ideas of these like fairy like creatures still exist. So, um, very interesting that way, Chris. And I want to know what you have for us today, because I'm quite interested to see where this little rabbit hole takes us yeah it is uh it's a good point brandon they it's cross-cultural and it's it's uh in terms of geography it's all over the world that we find these things and you know we take it all with a grain of salt but it, it would be silly to throw it all out the window uh, just because it has become so popularized and become such a phenomenon in hollywood and i you know we'll read this soon enough uh, i've got a lot of information for us today i've also got some video footage of potential fairies caught on camera and some photographs and also just written accounts. But one of the things I came across in my research today, um, and we'll read it in a second, but just to summarize it quickly, is that fairies only became a quote unquote fairy tale, which is obviously a a, a tale that doesn't have, you know, truth, but there's usually like a moral to it or something. That's where the term fairy tale comes from. But an actual tale about fairies were not considered uh, so grandiose and obviously, you know, fake or, you know, Hollywood. Uh, it actually started when Tinkerbell um, came into the onto the scene, you know, in um, in the early 1930s, I think, is when um, that all happened. And before Tinkerbell, um, you know, the fairy tales were actually t- uh, fairies <laughs> and the tales of fairies were taken quite a lot more seriously. So... You know, I'll get into it in, uh, right now because it, this is basically exactly what I'm talking about. And, uh, you know, some of my heroes, uh, certainly J.R.R. Tolkien, Mr. Uh, Lord of the Rings, was a a big believer in fairies and not just him, but some other famous authors. So I'm going to just quickly share my screen here and read what are fairies, just to give our audience here a little primer as to what we're going to be talking about today. And so, you know, basically fairies are a broad range. They can really, you know, there's so many different names across different cultures. And they're basically, you know, the general idea is that they're small magical beings who live in the forest and can be found anywhere where there's magic. A fairy's home may be a tree stump, an old well, or even, you know, a hollowed out log. 
Fairies have long been associated with nature spirits, and they often appear as animals such as owls, foxes, rabbits, squirrels, bats, birds, butterflies, and other creatures. Um, and just to kind of go off on that a bit, the, the fairies always seem to look a little different. And I want to emphasize spirits of the forest because so many people have had different experiences in um, more forested areas with different energies, different uh, supernatural, let's say, occurrences that happen in the woods. And, you know, Brandon, myself, we're nature lovers. We love to go out into the forest. And there is a real magic that happens, not just in nature in general, but in certain areas of nature. And, you know, why not? Why wouldn't, why couldn't there be, let's say, spirits or maybe beings that flip in and out of this dimension, perhaps? And when they flip into this dimension, what if they took the shape of what we would typically associate to a fairy or, as it says here, you know, other animals, but not quite the animals we expect. They, they maybe fly or do things that we don't, you know, associate with those animals. So just something to keep in mind. What if what if fairies, you know, to, to bring it into a more scientific realm, what if they're multidimensional and that's where they have this mythological or this sort of magical quality to them? They pop in and out of this this reality and and take different shapes. So anyway, moving on. So some fairies, of course, are mis mischievous, while others are helpful and friendly. Uh, some stories, fairies are said to be able to grant wishes, of course. But that's not always true. Fairies also, um, they're sort of the fairy tales were originally told by adults to, uh, to children so that they would learn about life and death. That's what that's what we associate usually with a fairy tale. Um, the fairies in these stories had no trouble communicating with humans because they lived in the same world. Today, fairies are still a part of many cultures around the world. And we're going to get into that a lot more soon. All around the world, everywhere around the world has fairies. So the following are examples of fairies from various countries. So we've got India. The fairies there are called um, Pisashis or Pichash, depending on how you pronounce that. Sorry for butchering that. But basically... We've got lots of names for, for fairies in India. Now, the way they describe them are little people that are sometimes depicted as having human bodies, but their heads are covered in a hood. They usually are seen dancing on moonlit nights. Now, we've got in Brazil, the fairies um, that are known as fadas, and they are described as being very beautiful and wearing colorful dresses. They are believed to be responsible for bringing rain. And in Japan, fairies are known as kikusui, and they're said to help farmers grow crops. So we're going to actually get into Thailand with some amazing video footage uh, a little bit later on in this podcast. So stay tuned for that. Then we got in China, the fairies are uh, Jingzheng. Again, sorry for the pronunciation. They're also known as Bixi, and they are considered good luck charms. In Korea, fairies are also known as Yulgup, and they are also known by the name Joanne Pill. Okay, terrible pronunciation. Uh, Scotland, of course, fairies are wee folk. They are said to be invisible unless someone has a problem. If someone does have a problem, then the wee folk will come out of a nearby bush and offer advice. That's awfully convenient. I like that. In Germany, the fairies are known as Schutznit Wurm, or I guess Schnitzel Wurm. And they are said to eat meat left over from cooking. And then, of course, Ireland, we've got fairies, uh, also known as leprechauns. And they are said to bring gold coins if you leave them, uh, leave them a pot of gold at the end of your rainbow. And that's where we get that famous myth in a delicious cereal known as Lucky Charms. So Heart that's... stars and horseshoes. That's me, Lucky Charms. Clovers <laughs> and blue moons. So, Chris, <laughs> as we're going through this, I'm just seeing... Once again, uh, getting on to this whole pan-cultural uh, interest of mine where I started to think like, what are the root causes of these stories that us humans seem to share with each other on this little rock spinning through space? And it all has to do with nature and it usually has to do with growth or elements. So we're seeing that, oh, they, they help the farms. Um, they help the problems. Uh, you know, they're, they're involved in the optical phenomena of a rainbow. They bring rain. Uh, these are all parts of nature. So it's interesting, once again, that there is a through theme. And I know that you could be completely pragmatic and be like, well, obviously, we, you know, we just 
this is how it was and stories spread through the world and it's like there's nothing more to it than that but it's interesting in improv when we play improv uh you play a game called broken telephone where you have you know let's say there's 10 people in the class and you whisper a message and by the time it gets to the end of that 10 people the message has been botched you know it's like i'm going to hurt you meanwhile it was like you know, uh, I think you smell nice. It was like the first one, right? So it breaks up. So I, I just don't think that these legends and myths would spread around the world if there was no uh, credit to them. And with all these different names as well, if there wasn't some sort of um, some sort of inherited memory, at least, of these creatures. Well, the similarities are quite striking. I mean, they're always very small, first of all. You never ever hear about these large fairies. Okay, so they're always very small. Right. They're very, very often humanoid, you know, usually wearing lavish clothing is another interesting thing. And um, and then they can flip-flop, whether they're on the good or not not so good side of things. They can be quite mischievous or even like straight up evil. I've heard many accounts of fairies stealing children and stuff like that, uh, luring people, and then these people are never seen again. And uh, of course, on the opposite, very benevolent and helpful and granting wishes, all this kind of stuff. But there's a lot of similarities and it's just something at least to consider. Like you said, we're not just talking, you know, the idea of, uh, well, you know, these ideas, it, it's the same argument that gets used for why are pyramids built all around the world, you know? It's like, well, you know, humans just thought that that would be a, a smart thing. No, <laughs> you know, these are complex structures that that require a very advanced architecture. You don't just make them randomly because of, yes, I believe there's obviously a collective consciousness, but there's something more going on. There's, there's a knowledge uh, that's being shared or an experience that's being shared, just like extraterrestrials, you know, UFO sightings all around the world. These are just common things that if everyone is experiencing everywhere in the world, there's got to be something to it. So that's what that's what we're looking at with fairies. And, you know, there's actually some pretty solid research out there. And when I was looking into this and I was reminded of a podcast I listened to quite a few years ago, and uh, I'm going to share my screen again and talk about this really interesting scholar uh, known as um, Dr. Simon Young. And he's got a book that I've pulled up here on Amazon. All these, of course, are going to be in the show links, so check them out for yourself. This book, I haven't read it, but I heard the author, Dr. Simon Young, talk about it on a podcast a couple of years ago, and it is really interesting, the amazing amount of accounts that he's got in this book of such a variety of people that have had really incredible experiences. Actually, a lot of them that I, I couldn't really find on the web, so it's a it's a pretty good research. If you're looking, If you're looking to sink your teeth into something at least... <laughs> relatively solid in terms of an academic scholarly approach to the research of fairies, not just, you know, the outlandish kind of stuff. Check this guy out, Dr. Simon Young. I'm going to read a little bit of a description from this book. And uh, just to give you an idea of not only the research he's done, but just where, where this is all kind of coming from. So when, like I said at the beginning of the podcast, when Tinkerbell followed Peter Pan to Hollywood in the 1950s, excuse me, it was the 50s, uh, fairies vanished from the realm of child lore. Yet, in 1923, 30-year-old J.R.R. Tolkien, my man, visit, uh, visited his aunt's house in Bag's End, which I love. Anyone that's a Lord of the Rings fan will know that the Hobbins, Hobbits lived in Bag End. Not, and so, obviously, that's named after his aunt's house, Bag's End, which inspired a true, uh, sorry, inspired a story about uh, hedgerow fairies or hobbits. And three years earlier, Sherlock Holmes author, Arthur Conan Doyle, um, published the Cottonley Fairy photographs, uh, which I saw online, and they're interesting. I, I didn't think to include them in this episode just because they look pretty fake. But anyway, they're interesting to look at regardless. And then in Ireland, a generation before, family members had uh, torched a woman to death thinking she was a fairy, while William Butler Yeats met a fairy queen on a coastal cave. Today, British and Irish fairy interests have recovered its old lustra. And gathered here is the, gathered in, in this book, um, the magical folk, um, are some of the latest learnings from leading folk uh, folklorists and historians. Uh, a tidal wave of new fairy sightings has been uncovered 
by the digitization of British and Irish newspapers and ephemeria. There are fairy sightings in urbanized locations and remote rural areas. Characters and means to ward off evil fairies uh, vary radically from place to place. In Sussex, there is the helpful Master Dobbs or Dobby, good old uh, Dobby from Harry Potter. While in Ireland, fairies may be the dead, and in Scotland, harbors the terrifying Whippity Story. In addition, Magical Folk, this book, includes findings from the Fairy Census, the first scholarly survey of modern fairy sightings in Britain and Ireland, demonstrating that the connection with the past continues unbroken. This is really interesting. So this is a scholarly survey, an actual census that they've put together. And I'm going to switch over to that. Well, the you can take a look at the census. It's on this website called um, fairiest.com. Again, it's in the show notes. Check it out. Um, and so you can even, yeah, click this, the fairy census here and basically add your own account to the census and then take a look at it. So I went on this website and basically you can look through a whole bunch. I'm scrolling down here. You can just see all these different uh, fairy accounts and it just goes on and on and on and on. So I pulled up two. Some of them honestly aren't that well documented. Um, but these ones were interesting. These are two written accounts, and then we're going to get into the actual juicy video footage after this. But these are two written accounts from, I think, the 1930s here. It says April 11th. This one's from April 11th, 1936. And it's these people that they wrote into a, um, a, a newspaper. Um, I believe it was in a sort of a a section of a newspaper, an article in a newspaper called John O. London's Weekly. Okay, so these people wrote into this and it was published in this uh, in this paper. Um, anyway, so I'm going to read this one out. This is um, this is an account from the 11th of April, or at least it was written on the 11th of April, 1936. So it says, when I was a boy of 10, we lived in Lanarkshire, Lanarkshire, beside a large park with trees and flowers. At early dawn one morning, I woke to see on a chair, which always stood beside my bed, two small old women of about 18 inches tall. Each wore tall conical dark hats and dark long gowns. They looked at me for about 20 seconds and then smiled to each other before jumping in slow motion to the carpeted floor where they passed from my line of sight. Very gently, I eased myself up into a sitting position so as not to scare them, and they had disappeared, or but they had disappeared. I got out of bed, peered under the furniture and into the cupboard, but could find no trace of them. The moon was full, and the red streaks showed in the sky. As a side note, interesting note that the moon was full. Sometimes these things do typically happen on a full moon. Um, the energy and the gravitational force on this planet is very different on a full moon, and a lot of weird things happen on full moons. As a side note here, um, interesting statistics from police um, stations all around the world. Crime always bumps up on full moons, always. Well, so it's the, the term lunatic, lunar is the uh, base word there. I didn't know that. That's really cool. Yeah, that makes perfect sense, right? And so just to consider this, put this in the back of your mind, right? There's some something definitely goes on energetically on this planet during full moons. Anyway, um, so the, the gentleman goes on to say, they were solid beings. I noted that their busts stood out clearly against the window across the room. It all happened 40 years ago, but it has never gone from my mind. They seemed to appraise me as a horse dealer might do a horse. There was really no affection in their eyes. And the feeling I had then was that I should have liked to catch them in my hands like birds. This was W.J. Fraser. So um, this is from England, uh, I believe. Uh, these both it's interesting are interesting from- that coming from Canada, um, now I, to my English viewers out there, I know that there's lots of great countryside in England, but it's, you know, I live in Ontario and Southern Ontario is almost the size, if not larger than the entire island of Great Britain there. And it's just interesting to see these nature beings still so pro, like uh, just so present 
in in cultures like England and things like that, where the countryside has been so developed over the years. And obviously there's like great farming communities and things like that. But to live inside of a small village or a town and just have the park is maybe even enough for them to 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 be welcomed into your life. So I wonder, Chris, when you say interdimensional, I mean, we, we use that as a scientific term for sure. Uh, the word magic is probably a more blanket term, and obviously they've always seemed uh, magical. Now, maybe magic is just undisclosed science, right? I mean, if you had a, a spaceship that went to the moon and back and showed, you know, Nostradamus or somebody, they'd be like, whoa. Um, but uh, but yeah, these fairies, they might, they might possess either technology or, or powers that we don't know, psi powers. It's very interesting stuff. Especially to have so many um, accounts. I know that when I was a kid, there was all these doctored photos, uh, or as I always said, they were doctored of fairies, you know, in the weekly world news and all these things that uh, I would want to buy at the grocery store. Check out. I wouldn't care about anything real, no sports or anything. They'd be like, what's going on now? Vampire attack? And I thought it was real too. I remember, oh man, locking myself away, being like, there is a vampire invasion going on. Um, But... <laughs> But yeah, fairy. So why don't you read us that next account? It was kind of interesting. I, I I like the detail and stuff. It's kind of the things that uh, liars usually forget to leave out. They're busts, um, whether that's just like the uh, the shape of the creature against the silhouettes or literally talking about their body measurements. They usually don't include uh, random details like that. Yeah, there were, um, there really were a lot of, uh, a lot of other stories where I was reading that really didn't feel truthful or if they did there, they were feeling that, um, you know, embellished and that's fine. You know, that's, that's, you know, <laughs> you're an actor, I'm a director. We, we love to embellish good stories uh, to tell them, to tell them well, but I'm, I'm more interested in this kind of stuff when they are a bit more dry in a way, because it feels well, like this might be too. Right. I mean right. They're so far back in time. We don't have us coming from it today in 2023. We have so much to pull from as far as all this uh, otherworldly information comes from people talking about fairies back then. Um, yeah, sure. They might have heard some stories and, and, and read some books, but they don't have Wikipedia or their favorite YouTuber or TikToker. Uh, to follow and get ideas in their head. They don't have Stranger Things. They don't have Peter Pan at their disposal. You know, that, at their disposal. They have, they have their own imagination and and perhaps, um, uh, you know, a, a less decalcified or calcified pineal gland and an ability to see through other worlds too. Yeah, great point, Brandon. I mean, I, you know, a lot we give a lot of flack to uh, people from the past. Oh, they didn't know any better. We obviously know better now. We're clearly more sophisticated and well, be better educated now. And uh, while that could be true in some ways, obviously, uh, in a lot of other ways, I think we've not only lost a lot of um, the open mindedness, perhaps of the past, but like you said, Oh man, we don't live in a bath of frequency coming from, you know, like electromagnetic frequencies coming from cell phone towers and, you know, EMF, like harmful EMF frequencies coming from every device we have, uh, Bluetooth, I mean, Wi-Fi, um, all of these things that do cloud our mind at the very least, uh, not to mention, of course, you know, yeah, decal uh, calcifying our pineal gland, which is our third eye, which allows us to truly see all these other dimensional energies, beings, things like that through the food, through GMOs. I mean, I could just keep going on, of course. Um, so that is something to consider that the, that the people of even just a hundred years ago, you know, they did have a different, um, let's say, Ooh, physiology and a, just because of the world they lived in. And, and for that reason alone, they maybe were able to see certain things. So let's, let's take a look at this next story. This is coming from uh, J.H. Cragen from also uh, 1930. Well, from 1936, May, May 2nd, 1936. At least that's when this was published in John O'London's Weekly. So it says, I have been deeply interested in recent letters from readers who claim to have seen fairies. Near my home in Co Derry, there is rich grazing plain of, of about 80 acres, which pastures annually a large herd of cattle. Three of its sides are fringed with a plantation 
and the other by a thick wood. On a certain summer evening, about 20 years ago, five men, employees of the estate, were engaged in dredging the canal, which runs through the middle of the plain. One of the laborers, who was a little in advance of his fellows, approached a thorn bush, which uh, grew on the side of the rampart, of the rampart. And there he had a unique experience of seeing a little man about 18 inches tall with a conical hat and a red coat come out of the side of the bank and dart off as quickly as a rabbit. The man shouted at his companions, who came running up in time to see their friend racing after the conspicuous figure in the red coat. The pursuer was a good runner, but the wee red coat soon outdistanced him. And although he continued the pursuit with his companions behind him, it faded into obscurity at another rampart on the edge of the plantation. No further trace of it could be discovered. These men had always been skeptical as regards to the supernatural. Yet to this day, they swear that they actually did see a fairy. So this was J.H. Cregan. Um, okay, so right away, uh, we see the 18 inches, which was, if not exact, it was roughly the same size as the past one. Yep, exactly. Inches, yep. And a conical hat once again. So it might not have been a black conical hat, but... Uh, a conical hat, nonetheless. So something about a foot and a half tall wearing a pointed hat. Was it a foot and a half tall with the hat or was it shorter? Uh, but still, that's that's a lot of similarities. And as well as the gentleman is saying, I didn't see this, but these guys I respected, uh, they were no-nonsense farmers and they are like, I don't believe in the supernatural. However, you get a couple. Yeah, I'm going to tell you this story about a fairy. That's my supernatural. I didn't see a ghost. I saw a fairy. Yeah, it's uh, it's worth yeah. considering. So, well, uh, geez, I wonder why that. I mean, I guess they would have to run away. We probably, if we caught them, we would cage them up or nowadays dissect them. I'm sure. What yep. makes you work, fairy? Speak. Where are the lucky charms? <laughs> Give me my lucky charms. Yeah, you could just see the uh the you know the military wanting to to figure out, you know, everything they can, of course, from these things. You're absolutely right. But you know, would it be any different in the past either? You know, if if the powers that be also got a hold of them? Probably not. Uh we've been very similar in that regards uh for no, a long, the king long, long time. Like this is my fairy now. It sits in my throne room as I prod it and poke it and get a gesture <laughs> to play with it. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, so um, moving on from uh, yeah, what else from, from written accounts, we've actually got some interesting footage that we can go through, Ooh, and footage. Uh, footage is fun. Footage is fun. There's a there's there's a lot of photos. Um, it's just it's tough. It, everything could be fake now. So of course, audience, we we love you guys. Uh, so just of course, always let us know what you think. Let us know in the comments, fake or real, please. Let us know. I, I sifted through and I tried to find the stuff that at least looked the most real. And even some of the stuff I thought was actually kind of real after further investigation, uh, a couple of other people have debunked and it, it was a definite legit de debunk for sure. So I, I found some stuff that might be legit. So if we will... I may interject here, I, I just want to say to our audience, a lot of places around the world believe in fairies. Go to Iceland. And tell them you don't believe in fairies and they'll tell you they're real however go to other places in the world and try and talk about fairies be like you know what global politics aside i want to talk about fairies you're gonna get lapped out of the room so let's just have some fun and see what we got absolutely and actually we're going to start with a really interesting video here that gives us some um real background on um, we're going to get still in the realm of fairies, but when I was talking in the beginning about sometimes fairies that are beings, these, these little beings that come out of plant life. And so still beings of the forest, magical, but these are these legendary fruit fairies in Thailand called the Nerafon or the Makilafon. Okay. So check out this video. It's actually a decent explanation as to what these are, the legend of them, but then also crazy enough, some physical evidence that we have to this day to check out. And I just realized I probably don't have the sound on. So let me reshare that. Yeah, cool. Yeah, really. Classic Chris. 
classic Chris always doing that. Yeah. So check this guy. This is really interesting. So this come from Thailand and um, yeah, here we go. Particularly in Thailand and Southeast Asia, the legend of human shaped fruits is widely believed. There are many variations in legend, but the basis is a fairy like fruits that grows in a sacred forest. These fruit fairies are called Naripan or Makalipan. When the fruit ripens, it becomes a full length girl of about 16 years old, hangs on a tree with hair, and can make a voice. Nari Pan screams Waku Waku when she dies. Therefore, the tree which bears Nari Pan is sometimes called an Waku Waku tree. These are not Nari them. Nari Pan or Makalipan is usually a girl, but sometimes Nari Pan is a girl and Makalipan is a boy. We'll get to the evidence in a second here. When Nari Pan grows up, she falls from the tree and can dance and sing, but her life seems to be about a week. Dead Nari Pan is said to dry, shrink, and mummify. Many would think it is just a legend, but surprisingly, mummified Nari Pan and Makalifan are stored throughout Thailand. These mummified Nari Pan are stored at Wat Phranong Chaksi, a temple in the city of Singburi north of Bangkok. The head has a projection that seems to be a remnant of hanging from a tree. It's hard to see through the case, but it looks like a woman because it has breasts. However, if you look closely at the two bodies in front of the case, you can see a woman on the left and a man on the right. These are exhibited at the Siam Museum in Bangkok. A total of four mummified Nari Pan are on display. The middle of the three bodies on the left is a man. On the right, the gender is difficult to distinguish, but the limbs are separated from the body, making it more realistic. Rather than fruit, it is a mysterious creature that walks on two legs. And here is an article about sacred tree growing women shaped fruit, by Mail Online, a UK web news site. Whether this is true or not, a completely women shaped fruit appears to be growing on the tree. If this fruit dries, it will surely look like a mummified Nari Pan left in Thailand. If this were real, why would human-shaped fruits grow on trees? There is one recent study that is of interest. According to Dr. Luke Dunning of the University of Sheffield, UK, plants such as grasses are able to shortcut evolution by taking genes from their neighbors. Such horizontal movement of genes is called horizontal gene transfer. If such a mechanism is working, it might be possible to take genes from nearby animals. Humans often interact with plants through farming. It may be possible that fruit bearing plants could take human genes. Of course, if a plant had taken genes from human, it is unlikely that the fruit will take on a human-like shape. However, there have been many reports of plants with human-shaped roots or fruits. Fairies living in the forest can also be explained by horizontal gene transfer. These are the mummified Nari Pan and Makalipan, displayed at Watford Prang Muni, a temple in Singburi. Length will be about 15 centimeters. Its shape resembles humans, but it looks like a fairy-like creature that is clearly different from humans. According to the temple, these Nari Pan were screened at a national hospital in Thailand. As a result, it is said that it had a structure similar to humans, had internal organs, and was not a fake. There may be unknown creatures that cannot be defined as plants or animals, deep in the dense forests of Southeast Asia. Recent research has shown that the evolution of living things cannot be explained by simple conventional theory of evolution. By adding the element of horizontal gene transfer to evolution it so that's i mean just when you think you hear everything 
then apparently people are telling you there's human-shaped fruit growing. And oh, not only does that happen, but we have the mummified remains. Right. And it's probably some ancient culture, right? Like this is not just some person who's bringing this up. This is probably entrenched in the culture. So there's got to be something to, to it. Say. There's got to be something to it. So, to so, so, so crazy. Right? Like you, you just... Ah. I, I mean, it seems too crazy, but yet why are we talking about it? On this well, podcast, so you know, it's obviously uh, interesting. Now, here's here's another video that just um, that is, is just an additional footage um, to the last the last pieces of evidence we saw in that that video of the um, uh, the Nari Pond. Okay, so this Nari Pond, this this humanoid, you know, plant like creature, fairy. Um, this was a additional footage shot of this same exact, um, these two mummies that we saw in the last mummified, um, Mari Pond in the last one. So take a look at this. It's really interesting. It's just more detail on them. For the listening audience here, these are just close-ups of the face that are really incredible, uh, and the body structure. And, um, you know, you can really see pretty, you can see this hair like old strands of hair, it looks like hair. Even maybe teeth, look at this. So this is the size of it in someone's palm. Basically it's the size of somebody's palm, uh, the size of someone's hand, a little smaller than the size of the, their hand. Look at the ribs, that uh, rib structure there, pretty incredible. And then look at this, like the spine, rib cage. It's interesting that they kind of bend and shrivel like a fruit as well. Like a fruit. Like the legs look like a, you know, like a carrot that's run out of water. Yeah, and and you would know that, you know, you dehydrate a lot of your food for camping and stuff like that, right? So that is um it is I guess in a way typical of what would uh what would happen to a fruit fairy humanoid being perhaps when they when they die. And, you know, I don't know. It's wilting. They're, they're wilting away. I mean, it's very interesting. And those those last two that they were talking about said that um, they were brought to hospital. That's so right. So obviously, when whoever had this fruit was like, okay, my fruit fairy is dying. Is there a doc? There's got to be something you can do. Yeah, Doc, come on. We got to look at my fruit fairy. Forget my dog. My my animals like my fruit fairy needs some help here, which is yeah. true. Which, I'm not which, going to a vet. <laughs> you know, and, and and so they and you know they got they basically those were verified in a hospital. So we, we've got some evidence out there. It's not just well fairy tales, right? We've got some we've got some evidence out there. Now we're going to look into some video evidence. Which yes, of course, it could always be CGI. So I looked around and found the stuff that I felt was the most compelling. And uh, once again, let us know in the comments uh, what you guys think of these ones. So we've we've got uh, yeah, we've got we've got something here. So this is the first video that I came across. This one are these kids showing their dad something on video. They have no intention on filming a fairy, and at the end, something mysterious happens. And uh, Ooh, I like these ones. Let's let's take a look at this one here. Yeah, see, the wood just popped up like this. Ooh. Yeah. And this is the slide. This is like a little equipment thing with a swing and a slide. And in the summer, it's fun because we put these mats down and the hose and it. We put, we put the hose down uh. on there and go down and it. We go down on it and it's like gold for really boys. It's a bit is, wet now. Really yeah, it's yeah. really wet now. This is because it rained last night. This okay. is an apple tree, and it's oh, wow. big apples, very big apples. Are they still on it? There's a are they few all falling? Some there, and some but there. There. most of them are on the floor. And have oh, yeah. Holes in What's them that? Well. Yeah. Oh, look. What's what? Where? Yeah, look. Why up there? Insect or something. Is that an insect? Let's have a look. What is it? I don't know. I don't know. Oh my god. Oh. So at first it's like that looks like a dragonfly. 
that looks like a dragonfly but i'm gonna i'm gonna play it back so hopefully we can find the frame where it looks like you can see two feet mm. tricky okay i'll play it again is that an insect let's have a look I don't know. I don't know. Oh my god! Like, it could be an insect, obviously. But uh, can you almost make, like, again, like a, a bust of, like, you know? Yeah, I see. Well, I see two legs. Two legs. It looks like there's two arms. And yeah, there looks like <clears throat> there's some kind of chest. Excuse me. It's. So this kind of, when I was looking at it, the sound sounds great. The thing kind of holds there for a minute. Maybe it could be faked. If it was, then kudos to the kid and the family. Cause obviously the dad has a hobby of doing this kind of thing mm -hmm. and they went through mm -hmm. it all and it was great. Um, or the other thing that goes to my head is that, uh, it, you know, it kind of looks weird. Like it almost it doesn't look natural, but isn't that what every fairy account says is that the way they move uh, you know they jump to the floor in slow motion so i used to love these when i was a kid i, I used to look into fairy stuff all the time and you know it's just if they are this big and they are lurking they could be around and we could not see them i mean i used to get interested with weird bugs and stuff in my backyard um i don't know i i'd say this one is uh I would lean towards this one being more authentic than than fake, but you know, it's still it's so fantastical. Where do you really lay? It's tough. It's really tough to say. So, uh... oh. Oh. <laughs> and he's pretty grossed out or freaked out. Oh, sounds uh. like sounds like King of the Hall. Oh. Yeah, oh. right. <laughs> so this is a photograph that someone took, and then the person um, basically zoomed in on it in a video here and you know this is a small youtube channel well i mean about the size of ours right now but uh you know th this person hasn't gained a lot of traction necessarily with this and sometimes that actually what's is what interests me uh even more on some of these videos so let's just take a look at this one this is a photograph where we can examine some also um she mentions orbs a lot i believe in this one either way i've heard this a lot orbs Orbs, of course, that's um, very common with um, ghosts and the paranormal. With ghosts, with Sasquatch, with UFO. You want an orb? What can I do to get some orbs around you today? You're going to have something weird happen to you. Right? It seems like orbs are, I don't know if they're energy or it's they energy, are the fairies. For sure. There, there's or it's, it's the gin or whatever, the magic. It's just crazy. There's orbs all around. My, my little nephew sees orbs and then says, ghost. And I'm like, eh. <laughs> Uh, so, so we'll see. I'm always way more interested when, when kids are saying that, cause I think they're, they're probably a lot more able to see these things because they haven't been conditioned out of it yet. Um, so let's take a look at this, uh, but, uh, but, uh, I'll rewind here. So yeah, here we go. Friday night and captured many orbs and this winged creature again. This time when we zoom in and have a look, it was flying really low to the ground. And it's beginning to look even more and more like a fairy, or a pixie, should I say. That's a pretty odd looking shape right there, isn't it? These are like a little head, these are like arms, two pretty cool wings. What are these? Legs or a body or something? What is this going up here? So, and that's it in relation to the actual size. It was close down by the grass with lots of other orbs. Now I captured it again a few shots on. Just down here, if we go down and have a look. It's on a slightly different angle this time. But again, it's sort of more like a front-on view. Quite hard to capture on the video screen. But it's still holding this, or still has this strange, like a wand or something up here. Those appear to be the wings at the back of it this time. It's more like a front on. That's sort of maybe the body of it there and the legs down here, but it's definitely holding something there. So again, down on the grass, that's just wet grass there, and surrounded with many orbs. 
It was a night of many, many orbs, strange and yeah, there's a shop with none. They're, and these are all just taken seconds apart from each other. So that's a pretty pixelated image um, for the viewing or sorry, the listening audience. Very pixelated. Um, but curious. I'm I'm really curious because of the orbs around it, because that to me is is a sign of there's some high um high energy earth energy a lot of uh, ancient sites around the world when the energy gets really high during uh, certain points of day usually just before dawn there's been uh, some amazing experiments done um, that a lot of the ancient sites have uh, huge surges of energy as the earth rotates and usually at dawn it's one of the surges happens and typically when they take photographs it's like tons of orbs so a lot of earth energy, uh, you could call them maybe telluric currents, uh, ley lines perhaps, or just earth energy in general that's showing up on a photograph as an orb. It's just something to consider now when there's a fairy, you know, attached to that. So uh, I don't know. Um, this is uh, another video I'll play for you. And uh, this will be the last one for today's episode. It has music playing over top of it. So I just muted it. Um, let's just go back to the beginning and take a final meander. Do fairies really exist? Do they? So this is a uh, black and white camera <clears throat> filming at nighttime, clearly in, I don't know, a forest, perhaps. Maybe it's a uh, yeah forest cam. Now, at first, okay, so it, it goes right into the camera. Yeah, it's right into the camera. It's this white wings. Now I'm like, this could be a butterfly. This could be a moth, you know um definitely to me at this stage right now we're looking at something flying right into the camera all yeah, i'm seeing are bird wings bat. bird bat it could be anything right a bird bat a bird bat obviously it's that <laughs> so if we wait a little bit further into the video though you can see a better image of it so it's still flying it's very bright as it flies there we go oh yeah so it slows it down if you can see yeah that uh there, did you see a pair of shoes i'll rewind it if it doesn't do it here but yeah you see so it looks like a giant beetle except the, for that is wearing little shoes it's wearing little shoes <laughs> look at these things oh my god like it almost you could almost like see the buckle could, on the shoe or something like the if wow. it's not, not something paranormal it's that Definitely a giant beetle, like a June bug or some giant beetle flying around. Um, because I can kind of like I can kind of make out maybe the humps of the back to open up and let the wings out. And but uh but yeah. Yeah, that looks like a beetle there. Right. But then, but then on the side, then, all know, of a sudden it might be an optical illusion because it's gonna have multiple feet laying down. Anyway. Anyway, it's uh it's something to consider. So for those you know watching and listening, please let us know in the comments what on earth uh, you think of all these things. I think the main takeaways are this is a cultural phenomenon, okay? A lot of similarities that have been described for thousands of years. And more recently, of course, in the last couple hundreds of years, we have more written accounts. And uh, certainly now we've supposedly got some video footage, perhaps, uh, and photographs as well. So there's something going on there's clearly a lot of earth energy that happens in these uh sightings which is why we see a lot of orbs you know and certain photographs at the very least and then it's worth um if you're really wanting to do a more academic deep dive uh and uh, this is all going to be in the comments or the sorry the show notes below so check it out uh dr simon young his book magical folk British and Irish fairies from 500 AD to the present. It's going to be your most, I don't know, academic scientific approach to this uh, that I know of. If there's probably some other stuff out there. Please let us know what you found that is a good research tool or resource um, for fairies and magic folk of the forests, because this is really interesting. You know, Brandon, there's just so much out there. Um, we have a million different names for these things, but there's there's something going on. There's something that we don't understand. And what we'd like to throw is the word magic because we just we say things are magic when we don't know really what they are. It could be a spiritual science too, that they have, you know. Chris, I would say out of all the creatures uh and phenomena that we talk about, 
on this podcast, if you were to go out into the woods and speak to the fairies, I mean, if anyone's going to answer you, it's going to be them. Uh, if we ignore them, maybe they get the cold feet, but it seems like a lot of the stories say that they are a little more curious, a little more uh, whimsical, a little more tricky. And uh, yeah, you might just get what you're asking for. So look, I can't wait. We have some beautiful comments coming in. Uh, every video has uh, has some discussion going on it. So please, if you haven't done it yet, chime in. Let me know. Was that a beetle? Might have been a beetle. Might have been a fairy. Do you have a story? Do you remember maybe seeing, uh, don't forget, uh, elves and fairies are not, not too far away. Was there some sort of experience you had? Did you like the way that Chris's collar, uh, you know, accentuated his neck today? <laughs> you let us know and and we'll get, at, we'll get back at you. And if it's a great comment, we'll feature it in the show as well. So thanks so much for listening, guys. I had a great time. Happy St. Patty's Day. Have a beer for us. And if you're late, you'll just have to have one when you watch this podcast. And uh, yeah, Chris, thanks for having me on again. Any last comments to our listeners? Well, you know, um, like Brandon said, thank you, uh, everybody, for tuning in. Let us know what you think. If you have any accounts of your own, we'd love to hear. We're getting more as the channel does grow. It's still in its infancy. As the channel grows, we're getting more and more really interesting comments. Uh, we just had a comment recently on our dragon video of a, a, a person who claims to be a shaman from uh, Asia who has a very intimate knowledge with these dragon creatures and how they appear in nature, which I didn't tell you about Brandon yet, but I uh, just read that recently on our comments. So very, very interesting. It's, it's getting... Yeah, it's getting really, really cool right now. So these comments are going to be and already are the lifeblood of the channel. So thank you already to everyone and just encouraging you to to share more. So uh, especially uh, these accounts, if you've had any accounts, let us know. This is so, so cool. We'll definitely do follow-up episodes if you have some personal accounts you want to share with us or just information. Thank you very much. Of course, uh, you can also join the Ancient Mysteries Unearthed community. As Brandon likes to say, I think it's 33 cents a day. It's basically nine. cents a day. <laughs> it's also $9.99 a month. And you can connect with people like myself, Brandon, and other curious minds, which is one of the cool things about this path of discovery is all the cool people that you connect with along the way. So as always, stay kind and stay curious. Thank you so much for watching. And we'll catch you next time on Ancient Mysteries on Earth. Thank you very much, Brandon, for being here on a St. Patty's Day episode. Oh, it's great. Okay, bottom of the evening, everybody. Ciao, ciao for now. Ciao, ciao.